Good afternoon, everyone. Shh. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Mann, and I'm a member of the City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum Council. I'm a senior at Hathaway Brown, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's forum on the death penalty featuring Sister Helen Prejean. Sister Helen is a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph. She began her prison ministry in 1981 when she dedicated her life to the poor in New Orleans. While living in the housing projects of New Orleans, Sister Helen became pen pals with Patrick Saunier, a convicted killer of two teenagers sentenced to die in the electric chair of Louisiana's Angola State Prison. Her experiences with Saunier opened her eyes to the Louisiana execution process, and she turned her experiences into Dead Man Walking, a book that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1994. Fifteen years after beginning her crusade, the Roman Catholic sister has witnessed six executions in Louisiana and today educates the public about the death penalty by lecturing, organizing, and writing. As the founder of Survive, a victim's advocacy group in New Orleans, she continues to counsel not only the inmates on death row, but the, vi the families of the murder victims as well. She has written a second book, Death of Innocence, as well. So please welcome Sister Helen Prejean. Okay, everybody fasten your seatbelts. I'm going to take you with me on a journey, okay? <clears throat> the journey got written up in a book, but before there's a book, there are experiences. And all the education that we have been given, as you are given now, uh, help us when we go to do whatever our task in life is going to be. And it may end up that we do an, a number of different kinds of tasks in life. We may be, have a family, we may do work in the public sector, and we may get involved in something that grabs our heart and impassions us. Human rights is one of those things that captured me. And this book, Dead Man Walking, I didn't set out to write a book. I didn't set out as a Catholic nun to get involved with people on death row. But what happened to me is that first I came to understand that the gospel of Jesus, this thing of being a Christian, really meant not just being kind and charitable to everybody around me, but it meant getting involved in justice in the community people that don't have a voice, people that are caught in poverty, people that don't have access to wonderful schools like you go to. And I woke up to justice as part of the sisterhood. I belonged to a sisterhood, Roman Catholic nuns, and we were always engaged in education. And so what happened is that I moved into the St. Thomas housing projects from having lived out in the suburbs all my life and never being able to meet African-American people as my peers. I grew up in the Deep South in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and during the days of segregation when African-American people were not allowed to go into theaters or to schools or to, to uh, even churches, I was blind at that time. I, I said, well, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, being where they're supposed to be. I didn't question what it might mean to be an object of oppression or racism. And when I woke up and I moved to the St. Thomas Project, well, then I got a real education on the other side of life. When you don't have white privilege, when you don't have all these resources, people really struggling against great odds. I learned courage in families of mamas and young people that I never knew existed. And it's while I was there that one day coming out of uh, Hope House, the Adult Learning Center, a friend of mine who worked at this prison coalition office said, hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal to somebody on death row here in Louisiana? I didn't even know much about the death penalty. I said, well, yeah, sure, I, I could write some letters. It was the early 80s. We hadn't executed anybody in Louisiana in over 20 years. We thought the death penalty was on its way out. And I wrote the man a letter. Patrick Saunier was his name. He's the first story in this book. He wrote back, and I realized that he, he didn't have anybody to visit him, so I start visiting him. Then I find out he has a brother who's serving two life sentences. I didn't know what the murder was yet. I know he's on death row because he murdered somebody. 
But it was a, a question I had about the legal system. I mean, I know we have students here today that are taking street law, that you're coming to understand the legal system. I didn't know anything about the legal system, but I did have this question right off the bat. So here I meet Patrick Sonia, who's on death row for the murder, whatever it was. He's got a brother serving life. I go, how did that happen? How do you have one brother who gets a death sentence, one gets life for the same murder, when there were no other eyewitnesses? Now I really know some stuff about how the death penalty works. And if there are only the two co-defendants, there are no other witnesses, did you know this? That if one person give state's evidence against the other and says, yeah, he did it, they get a reduced sentence for saying that. There's a man in Ohio's death row, Arthur Tyler, who's been there for 28 years. He's there solely on the word of the other man who was present who, and, who, and who actually, I believe, is the one who murdered a, 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 a man who was on the street in the parking lot. But he said... Oh, yeah, Arthur Tyler did it. He got a reduced sentence for saying that. Later, he recanted, and, and he said, I, but I was pressured, and, and they threatened to give me the death penalty if I didn't say that. And Arthur Tyler's been on death row 28 years, and there are people trying to help Arthur Tyler. Maybe you've heard of Innocence Projects, of people, you know, young college students that get involved in these cases, in Illinois, it was the 13th innocent person coming off a of death row that influenced Governor George Ryan, who had always been for the death penalty, to look into the death penalty and say, this thing is broken. Just while I'm governor, they've come into my office 13 times to say a person's innocent. We're going to have a sign-up table out there, and there are ways you can get involved in acting. And one of these would be to take the case of Arthur Tyler because his family is trying to get the truth out about his case and to get him freed. But you've got to look into things. You've got to check it out. You've got to really get your information. Yesterday, when we were at the legislature in Columbus, Moeller High School students from Cincinnati, we all went on the bus together and we were there in vigil when Reginald Brooks was executed by the state yesterday. And then we all went up to the legislature together. And I want to tell you what, I've been to a lot of legislatures, and I've been to, had a lot of dialogue, and the young people in there talking with the legislators about the death penalty was one of the most informed and challenging and spirited dialogues that I've seen. Because the young people went in there not just on emotion, but they knew their stuff. They knew their facts, and there was real dialogue. So let me tell you what happened to me. So with this first man, Patrick Sonier, the one I visit, I get to know him. And, and then I found out about the murder. And the reason the death penalty is a tough moral issue, here's the reason, because we're not talking about most of the time innocent people. I, the first man I met on death row, he and his brother were guilty of one of the most terrible murders you could imagine because it... They killed two young people just like you. And when I found out what they had done, and I saw the picture of David LeBlanc, 17, Loretta Bork, 18, who had gone to a football game on a Friday night, went to a place afterwards, a local lover's lane to park, and there the two brothers had been, and they accosted the young people and abducted them and killed them in cold blood. And when I realize this, I'm horrified at this because I've become spiritual advisor to the two men who did this unspeakable crime. This was as old as my nephew and my niece, and these kids are now da dead forever. And then I go, wow, the parents, this is the worst nightmare for parents that you can have. And I made a terrible mistake because I thought, wow, I ought to go I ought to try to do something for the victim's family, but then I was scared. And I thought, ooh, they're not going to want to see me because I'm the spiritual advisor to the two people who kill their kids. They'll get very upset. They'll say, what? You're giving spiritual consolation to the two people who killed our kids? There was nobody in that sugar cane field that night 
when they killed him in cold blood. And I stayed away from the victim's family, and it was a bad mistake. In fact, you know, when I wrote this book, when I wrote the first draft of the manuscript, my editor noticed that when I talked about not reaching out to the victim's family, he said, well, well, Sister Helen, he says, that was a bad mistake. You're kind of letting yourself off easy here. Uh, he said, it was cowardice, wasn't it? I mean, you were scared, weren't you? I said, yeah. He said, look, when you write your book, don't just write about how you did everything well, the kind of the peaks of the waves where you do it all right. Bring people with you in the trough of the wave to where you made mistakes because they're going to trust you then as you tell your story because we all make mistakes. It was a big mistake and I met the victim's family probably at the worst possible time you could meet a victim's family because in Louisiana, and I would think that happens here in Ohio too before a person's executed, you have a pardon board hearing and you couldn't be more polarized. Which side you on? It's the closest you can come to a Roman amphitheater where they used to put their thumbs up for the gladiators to live and people would put their thumbs down for somebody to die at the pardon board. What side you on? Are you for life or are you for death? And a victim's family's been told, of course, bring all your friends, bring all your relatives because this is your last chance to last legal hoop you got to jump through to get your justice. And what's their justice? Their justice is going to be the death of this man, and they're going to get to watch. And that is what they're given as their justice. And you've got to think about that now. What really happens to people? The man, Reginald Brooks, who was killed yesterday by the state of Ohio, and all of our names are on that gurney because we're all citizens of this. We're all part of it. That family waited over 20 years to get this justice. 20 years they're waiting. Yeah, but he, we're going to get our justice. They're going to execute him one day, and we're going to get to be there. And I want you to reflect on that. What can that really do to a human heart? Does that heal a human heart to watch now as the state kills the one who killed your loved one? And what is the answer for victims' families? What do they need? And this will be something we can talk about together in the questions and all. What could cure or help to heal a human heart who's gone through such a terrible loss and violation of life? I end up being involved in on both sides, and then I'm with the man, this man, Patrick Sonier, who's executed. And there in the death chamber, there's a protocol of death. It's a public document. You could send off for the state of Ohio of what is the protocol of death when the state of Ohio executes a human being and how three days before that's what they do in Louisiana you brought to the death house and then two days before then you have the whole process when the media comes in uh, uh, who will be the witnesses your process for signing up those that are going to be the state's witnesses I've been in the Texas killing chamber as well and the gurney is right in the middle of a deep well. There's a bright light in the room. And there are three viewing stations that watch as the execution proceed. And one is the state's witnesses. They look through a one-way glass. You can't see them, but they see in where the person's strapped down on the gurney. The other is where the victim's family has, sends in representatives to watch the killing. And the other, the window that faces right to the face of the person lying down on the gurney is where mothers have stood with their hands against that glass as the state killed their child. And that is what we say is the way we're going to deal with violence in our society. And it's, it, has, it has language around it that we hear. Well, we're being tough on crime. You kill... We're going to kill you. Maybe that'll deter people from committing murders. Does it? Start digging into this issue. Look, we've done the death penalty about 30 years. Check out the, the record of states that execute the most and look how much violence happens. See, does the execution and using the death penalty really stop people from committing violent crime or not? Is it a deterrent or not? It's one of the moral issues we have to look at. It's one of the reasons given 
about why we need the death penalty. One of the main reasons given, though, is, and I've heard prosecutors at trial say, is the jury now, you got 12 people, ordinary people, just like us, and you have two trials when you have a capital case. One is just to find if the person's guilty or not. Say you find them guilty, and it's what's called a felony murder. They're eligible for death because of this murder that is so terrible. Then you move to what's called the sentencing part, the second trial. And there the jurors, 12 of them, have, they are given the task then to hear all the reasons that they give for why you shouldn't execute the person, why you should show mercy, and they go behind those closed doors and all 12 have to vote for death in order for the person to die. If one person in the room doesn't vote for death and it's 11 to 1, the person will live. You've got to have a unanimous vote for the person to die. I tell the story in my second book, The Death of Innocence, about a man. It was Robert Sawyer's case, a man in Louisiana. And he was on that jury that decided whether Robert Sawyer would live or die. And he didn't want to vote for death. He thought, look, he's going to be in prison the rest of his life. And you have to know that about Ohio. Ohio, that when a person does not get the death penalty, they truly have life without parole. If it's safety that we're worried about, you got to know this, that the person's not going to get out of prison and kill again. A lot of people don't know that about Ohio. And the bill that is before the Senate, and now there's one coming before the House to repeal the death penalty in Ohio, and it states that in place of the death penalty, there'll be life without parole. So this guy, I call him the anguish juror in the book. So they all vote, and they, they take a straw vote first, and they go around the table, and the foreman of the jury leads it and says, okay, we're going to get just see everybody's leaning, see what we're dealing with here. So they vote. Death, death. Death, 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 death. And they come to this juror. He goes, hey, you know, let the guy live. He said, uh, he'll be in prison the rest of his life. And man, he said, boy, they all came down on me. I thought, you know, it was going to be like a democratic process. You know, you just kind of discuss the pros and cons. But he said, they came down on me and they said, you got to vote for death. If we don't have, you'll vote the guy and he could get out and he could kill again, all this stuff. And he didn't have real information either. And he caved in. The night Robert Sawyer was executed in Louisiana, Nick Trinacosta, his lawyer, got a call. And this juror was drunk and he was crying. And he said, I tell my son, son, never cave in to pressure for what you really believe in. And so as I got involved with these different six people that I've accompanied and been in the death house and I also have encountered the guards. Do you ever think of this? Who does the killing for us? Who was on that strap down team yesterday where Reginald Brooks was taken from the holding cell and brought down and strapped down? Are we outraged about the crimes that people do? Yes. And outrage is ethical. But boy, when you're close to it. And I tell the story in Dead Man Walking about Kendall Cootie, who was a supervisor on death row in Louisiana. And he had been through five executions. And he called me in one day. And he said, Sister, I'm not going to be able to keep doing this job. He said, because see, I was a supervisor on death row, and I know all the guys. I know their crimes. Some of them have done crimes I can't even begin to describe to you how terrible the crimes are. But he said, man, when you're close like this, and I don't even strap them in, my job is just to take a paper sack after they've been killed and go to their cell and get their toothbrush and get their personal belongings to send to their family. And he said, I come home after these executions, and I sit up, I can't sleep and I can't eat, and I don't want my kids to know what I'm doing. My daughter, my daughter would disown me if she knew that I was in there and what I was doing. So there's a kind of shame, and people are always kept anonymous in this. And why is that? And why are executions done behind prison walls? Why isn't it? If, if we say we believe that the death penalty is going to deter crime, wouldn't it be good to make it public? 
So, hey, you want to give an example of what's going to happen? Most people don't have a clue about how the death penalty works. Let me just give you a few things. The theory is that we're supposed to give the death penalty, this is what the Supreme Court of the United States has said, only for the worst of the worst murders. Now just think about that a minute. Worst of the worst. What's that mean? And usually when the state statute is written, they, they take a great big old bushel full of adjectives and they just throw it at the statute. <laughs> like worst means heinous, cruel, cold-blooded, uh, intentional, all these things. But then guess what? You got to apply it. You got to put it into practice. The first trigger to make the death penalty happen is the prosecuting attorney who decides when they're going to go for the death penalty or not. They have discretionary power. And when you begin to look at patterns of how the death penalty works, you can find the pockets where prosecutors here in certain counties go for the death penalty every chance they get, and right next door are, are prosecutors who never go for the death penalty. So you have unevenness in application. It's been that way from the word go. And worst of the worst, what is worst of the worst? Well, you kill my mama, but, well, that wasn't worst of the worst. It was only one lady in a house, wasn't a room full of people, wasn't a policeman. Or sometimes they'll put into the state statute if you kill a child. Well, God, of course, that's the worst possible thing, right, to kill a child? But whenever you're doing law, you always have to define. And so you have to define child. You can't just include people who act like a child. You've got to define child, right? So you say 12 years or younger. That's a child. You get the death penalty for the killing of a child. And I've been to these hearings and, and witnessed some parents who, was, who were appearing before the, leg the judicial legislative body when they were making this statute saying, our son Peter was killed and he was the light of our lives. But he was 15 years old. He wasn't 12 or younger. Are you saying our child doesn't deserve the death penalty? I mean, we lost a universe when we lost him, but he doesn't fit the definition of child. Or a woman says, my husband was a fireman, and he was going up the ladder to save people in a burning building, and a sniper killed him. And you have the death penalty for a policeman, but not for a fireman. What we come to is we are just human beings and we try to make our categories and we've been trying to make this thing work and it is filled with mistakes. It's filled with people like Arthur Tyler sitting there for 28 years on the word of one lone eyewitness. There are 138 wrongfully convicted people across the United States who have been exonerated because they were saved through innocence projects of volunteers, college students, save their lives. And so what kind of system is that? Why is it so broken? And so here's what worst of the worst means. If you look at the pattern of the 1,280 executions that have happened. You see they all fit a certain profile, and if you look and see who's on death row, they all fit a certain profile. Did you kill a white person or not? Because when people of color are killed in this country, their death penalty is seldom sought. Case in point, young Virginia Smith near Shreveport, Louisiana, North Louisiana, was taken into the woods 14 years old, taken in the woods by three men. The child was raped. Her throat was cut. She was left to bleed to death in the woods. Not only was the death penalty not sought for the three young men, young Virginia Smith was black. These three young men were white. Some of their daddies knew the DA, and they didn't even get a life sentence, two of them. We are the ones who have to apply this justice, and all kind of factors come into it. Young Virginia Smith was black, and these kids were white, and the power structure in that town near Shreveport was that, and race makes a difference. It makes a difference in everything. There's a book, The New Jim Crow, uh, by Michelle Alexander, 
that shows that one in every three young black men in this country ages 20 to 29 are incarcerated in this country for long sentences. And what's a crime? Drugs. Make drugs a felony. And two-thirds of the people in prison are there for nonviolent crimes. 2.3 million people incarcerated in this country. One in every three young black men. And when you make drugs a felony, then when you get out of prison, when you go to get a job, you have to say you have a, a felony on your record. You, you're not eligible for public assistance. You can't get public housing. And wh who gives you a job when you say you were a felon? In some states, you can't vote. So you're deprived. That's why Michelle Alexander calls it the new Jim Crow, because you permanently then are putting a substrata in this society. Everybody knows that the majority of people that do drugs are white. You have many, many more white people in this country than you got people of color. But yet when it comes to arresting people and incarcerating them, over 70% of those arrested for drugs are people of color. And we have massive incarceration now of people of color. And not just them, but a lot of people, 2.3 million. We're the biggest incarcerator in the world. And we're one of the last countries to be using the death penalty. When I go to Europe, I'm always asked, what is it about the American people? You still have the death penalty in your country. What is it about the American people, they say, that makes you so vengeful that you've got to have a death for a death? We haven't had the death penalty in Europe. Most nations in the United Nations now don't have the death penalty. You know who's in the top ten of incarcerators and those who practice the death penalty? The United States. Iraq, Iran, China, we're still up there with the people who do most of the executions in the world. Why? Why is that? What do you know about that? What do you think makes us hold on to the death penalty when so many other countries in the world have done away with it? I want to invite you to get involved in this issue. This isn't just a peripheral moral issue about a few terrible criminals that do a few terrible crimes to people. Our deep soul as a country is in this because it, and it embodies all of our wounds. It's only poor people who go to death row, almost always. It's people where the race factor of the white victims that play such a role, whereas when people of color are killed, uh, it's a negligible death. There's not much outrage over the death of people of color. And the third thing is that we're reaching for violence as the way to try to solve our social problems. If you want to be tough on crime, what you do is you say you're going to kill the killers and you have the death penalty. There's a cultural attitude of believing that violence can be redemptive for us. Can it? Ohio has a terrible death penalty. Last year, you were the second state to Texas in the number of people that have been killed in your name. In 2013, you're going to be killing people in Ohio once a month. There are going to be deaths. The, how does it change? I'll tell you how it changes. It changes with people like us that begin to get into it and become active citizens to begin to write to those legislators, beginning to talk to them, writing to the governor, talking to the governor. And you have the, the Ohio State Supreme Court that has said, they've, they've looked at enough of these cases that they know we got problems in Ohio with it and are saying we need to really study this thing and see how this thing's being applied. When you have your own state Supreme Court initiating a study, means that it's ripe, it's the right time to look into it. Tim Robbins has written the stage play. The one who did this film, he's also a playwright, and he's done something no other playwright has ever done. He's written the stage play of Dead Man Walking to be done by high schools and universities to bring us deeply into the issue and get people reading the book so that you can get into it. Which costs more? What do you think? The death penalty? or paying our tax dollars to keep a person in prison for the rest of their life. Sure seems it costs a lot more to keep them in prison for life, doesn't it? Is that true? Does the death penalty deter murders? 
Uh, is it really racially oriented the way I'm talking about? Or am I just blowing steam? And the nun's a little bit off on that about the race thing. Look on death row, it looks like equal white people, people of color. Hey, is that true about race? You need to dig into it. Are we truly one of the few countries in the world that practices the death penalty? The thing, great thing about the play, it's called the Dead Men Walking School Theater Project, is you do the play in your school, but at least two other departments in the school have to pick up the issue of the death penalty and study it. It's been do it, done by schools across this country. We have five more years of the project. I invite you to do it. And then I invite you to get involved. There's a state organization here, Ohioans to Stop Execution, citizens just like us. New Jersey did away with the death penalty. New York did away. New Mexico and Illinois, all because citizens got involved and said we don't want any more killing in our name and our state. And people get involved and there's change and movement happens. We are citizens. We are responsible. And our name's on that journey. If we say, well, I'm apolitical, I don't get involved in all this political stuff. It's a very political decision to make because you're supporting the status quo and it's being done in your name. So if we're not working to change it, then we are complicit in the practice of it. We can't be neutral. And when we find out about things that are morally wrong, that we believe are wrong, then we have that invitation and the responsibility, really, to begin to get involved. So thank you for letting me talk to you today. It's been great. We'll have time for real conversation, questions, answers, things we want to talk about. And don't forget about Arthur Tyler. Uh, if any people want to become involved in helping him, his sister, who's fighting to get her brother out of prison, uh, you could get involved, and there are sign-up sheets on him as well. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. You take over? Um, good afternoon. My name is Trevor Scott. I'm a member of the City Club Youth Forum Council, and I'm a senior at John Hay Early College. Today at the City Club Youth Forum, we are listening to Sister Helen Prejean. We will return to our speaker in just a few moments, but first we encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now while we break for a few announcements. We welcome you to the City Club Youth Forum, part of the traditional City Club, which began in 1912. It is the oldest continuous running free speech forum in the country. Today's City Club Youth Forum is made possible through grants from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, the Bruning Foundation, the Stocker Foundation, the William Weiss Foundation, and the Thomas White Foundation. We would like to thank our funders for their generous support. The City Club Youth Forum series is uh, planned by a council of students from several area high schools. I would like to thank the, mem the members of the council whose names are in the program. Also, please note that there are surveys and pencils on your tables. Please fill them out after uh, the forum is over and we will collect them on the way out. Now we would like to return to our speaker for a traditional question and answer. To ask a question, and it must be questions only, please raise your hand. As a courtesy, please stand, state your name, your school, and hold your applause till the end of our program. Our microphone holders today are Norris Mays of Max Hay High School and Alex Guinness of Grand Falls High School. Can we have the first question, please? Um, hello, uh, I'm John Hess from Berkshire High School. Uh, Hi, John. Yeah, we're in Geauga County. No one knows. I heard of it. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, Texas obviously has a higher rate of execution than other, or in other states in America. Uh, they have over a third of the executions that we did in, two, in 2010. Good information um, there. Yeah, as you've gone around the country, have you uh, found any other areas that have like a, like a strong stance on the on the death penalty for or against? And what kind of culture surrounds that? Excellent question. That's a very informed question. There's knowledge that fed into that question. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have noticed patterns in this country. Get this. 
the 10 southern states that practice slavery, the 10 southern states that lynched people from trees, or the states that do 80% of the executions in the United States. Everybody of the 34 states that still have the death penalty, including your own, have the same criteria from the Supreme Court only for the worst of the worst murders. But the real practitioners are the states with deeply embedded in slavery and racism and harsh penalties. It's always been that way. When you look at the history, after slaves were freed, during the days of Reconstruction, they had these black code books in, from the southern legislatures, and it said if a black man did a crime, if a black man stole an apple, he could be hung. If a white person killed somebody, if you had to kill a whole room full of people. And it's still that way. I mean, they just recently, a couple of years ago, changed, you know, the difference, a hundred a hundred percent more punishment for crack cocaine than powdered cocaine. Because it was well known that in the community more white affluent people would have white powdered cocaine and poorer people and often people of color had crack cocaine. There's a hundred. The punishment was hundred times as great for crack cocaine. So this thing still plays out. So definitely with the death penalty it's always been used in the states, in the southern states. And that's why I'm so worried about Ohio. What are you doing in there? And right after Texas last year in executing people, what's at play in your state that's making these politicians go for the death penalty and get away with it? Go, going for the death penalty and then putting you, ratcheting you way up on the charts as one of the top executors in this country. Ohio doesn't deserve that. Not the good and decent people in Ohio. And so that's why we need you digging into this issue. And you got to find that out so that we can work to change that. Excellent question, John. Who else got a question? Okay. Um, my name is Darnisha Higgins. I attend the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine at John Hay. And my question was, seeing as how you're against the death penalty, what encourages you to what encourages you to attend the death hearings? Is it because you want to place votes against the death sentences? Yeah, to, to attend the death hearings. You mean like in legislators, written legislatures, like I was yesterday in your legislature? It's just to share experiences with the legislators. I mean, with the legislators, they are politicians. They're running for office. A lot of times, they think, well, my constituents for me to get elected. It's what my constituents want. Well, look, I got to tell you, for 20 years I've been crisscrossing this nation. This is my third time here, you know, but for the Civic Club here at Cleveland. Because what I do is I talk to people to get people to think and share experiences. And I've, I've found that the American people, it's not that they're really deeply committed. Most people have never thought much about the death penalty because it's not one of the moral questions that touches us deeply. And that's why I go to the hearings, and that's why I talked yesterday to the legislators because stood alongside the two representatives, uh, Celeste and Antonio, who are going to introduce the bill. It takes courage to do that when you're, you're a salmon in a stream going against the political tide. To stand there with them and just say, hey, this is a winnable, a winnable uh, I've seen it done in New Jersey, I've seen it done in other states. And it's just to share experiences and education and stuff I know. You know, when you write a book, you do research because you want to make sure if you're like on a talk show or something and you say something that isn't too accurate, well, it goes away with the breeze. The next morning, everybody forget. You print something in a book and you got it wrong, man. People haunt you with that the rest of your life. <laughs> hey, look here on page 33, you said this? So, boy, when I researched this book, I learned a lot about the death penalty because I had to make sure that my facts were right. So I know a lot, and that's why I go, just to educate people, get people thinking, saying, hey, read about this, learn about this. Somebody else. Hello, my name is Mercedes Quarles, and I go to the Science of Medicine at John Hay. And, um, I don't know if you stated or not, but I wanted to know, did you ever go visit the victim's family? Yeah. And, like, and what did they say? Yeah, okay. 
the actually that story's in here. The the girl's family, the the girl that had been killed, were very angry at me, and they stayed angry at me, and I I couldn't visit theirs. The boy's family, David David's family. I went to pray with his daddy in this little church, and his daddy, and the reason I call his daddy Lloyd LeBlanc, the hero of this book, is because he took me through his, the journey of his soul, because, and here's how he put it, he said, you know, everybody was saying to me when David was killed, he was our only son, you got to be for the death penalty, Lloyd, or it'll look like you didn't love your boy. And he said, uh, I said, they're right. I almost lost my wife. She almost broke under this. And uh, I said, they're right, and I want to see them die. I want to see them both die. In fact, I wish they'd let me pull the switch. And he said, I went to that place of hate, and I didn't like myself when I went there. And then I thought, no, they killed my son but I'm not going to let him kill me because I've always been a kind person, always loved to help people. And, uh, and then I saw that hatred and that bitterness taking over me. And then I said, no, nah, I'm going to do what Jesus said. And he set his face then to go down the path of forgiveness. He was the first one that ever taught me that when you forgive somebody, it's not first and foremost something you do for them to relieve them of their burden but a way of preserving his own integrity that he wouldn't let the love in him be overcome by the hatred. And his story is in this book. And the play of Dead Man Walking that Tim Robbins has written uh, for, for you to do, it takes you to these deep, hard places. You're going to be the victim's family. You're going to be the prosecuting attorney. You're going to be the defense attorney. You're going to be the warden. You're going to be the guards. You're going to be everybody in this play. And... That was one of the things was to arrive at that place through him that maybe the killing of the person isn't the thing that brings a victim's family peace at all, but to find it inside yourself and the path of forgiveness. So um, thank you for asking that. That's a good question, too. Anybody else? Hi, Sister Helen. Yeah. Over here. <laughs> I'm Leslie Kanslayer from Beaumont, and I was wondering, when you think about Patrick Sonnier's death and when you discovered his murder, do you consider it one of the main driving forces to fight for this issue? Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about a driving force? Because I watched him be killed, and, and he looked at my face when, he, when they killed him. He was going to try to protect me. He knew I'd never done anything like this before. I'd never been in a death house. I'd never been in this protocol of death. And it was electrocution, so it was ghastly because they pumped 1,900 volts of electricity through his body. And so he was saying to me there in the last hours, look, Sister Ellen, you can't be there at the end because it could scar you to see this. And he was looking out for me. He cared about me. I had been accompanying him, visiting him for two years. And I found myself saying, Patrick, I don't know what it's going to do to me. It isn't about me. But it, it was intolerable to me that this man would be killed. And all those witnesses who had volunteered to watch him die all wanted to watch him die. And there wouldn't be one face there of somebody who cared about him and could show him his dignity. And I said, when they do this, you look at my face, and I'll be the face of Christ for you. He was a Christian. He was a believer in Jesus. And I was too. And I said, you look at me. And he did. The last thing, though, before they electrocuted him was they put a leather mask over his face to protect the witnesses from seeing what happens to a human face. Now they have it all clean, so to speak, with lethal injection, and, and you don't see any of this. Even the witnesses don't see it. And I walked out of that execution chamber, and he had looked at me, and uh, I didn't know how my whole life was going to be changed. I threw up. It was the middle of the night. There was nobody around except the few sisters, my sisters of St. Joseph, who had come to be with me. And, and I remember thinking clear as a bell, and it's been my mission ever since, the people are never going to see this. You're never going to get close to executions in Ohio. You're never going to see close up what's done in your name. But I had been a witness. I had seen it, so I had to tell the story. 
and I began talking to groups, little bitty, bitty, bitty groups, not big old audiences. Like St. Christopher's Nursing Home, I'll never forget that. That was my smallest audience I ever had because they announced after lunch, who wants to hear the death penalty? None. And three people from the nursing home came with me over to Parlor A. And I know there were three of them. So I started talking. It was after lunch. Two of them dropped off to sleep. I mean, there was one lady listening. And I had my eyes locked with that lady like, lady, don't leave. You're it for today. But I kept telling the story and learning how to take people on the journey over to both sides of this. And then that led to the writing of the book. Okay. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Ostricker from Vermillion. And you've said that politicians have thought that they wouldn't be voted for if they didn't have a strong stance for the death penalty. Have you found that one political party has a stronger stance on the death penalty than the other? Well, it's been hard to tell. Because most people, when they run for office, if they're Democrats or Republicans. In general, though, I would say uh, that there might be a slight leaning on the, in the Democratic Party, but not always. You really can't tell by party, I find. It's, people have to be personally convinced and be willing to stand up for moral values they believe in and not just go by, well, who's going to vote for me if I, if I take this stance? And once a politician is operating out of who will vote for me or is this going to be popular with the people or not, they have lost their moral grounding in issues because it's not voting out of conscience or what they believe. They're looking with their eyes to the next election. And that greatly influences this process. I'm going to California when I leave here. We're going to have a planning meeting in San Francisco to take the play of Dead Man Walking across California for the young people of California to play a role in ending the death penalty. You're not going to believe this. California has 720 people on death row. 720. They spent $4 billion just to get the first 13 people executed because they put in huge amounts of money for defense on both sides of it, prosecution, defense, long legal entanglements and the whole thing. And so we're going to awaken the young people to get to those politicians to just say we don't need to do this anymore. And so what you have to do is you have to p help people see a connection. You're spending millions of dollars on this machinery of death in Ohio and look at all the social programs being cut. And Martin Luther King used to say the most moral document you ever look at is a budget. Can't you say, well, that's the money thing now. Now we're into practical things. Are we off to moral issues? Uh-uh. Money's real moral. And how we use our resources for death or life is really a moral question, too. And that's part of what you need to do to look into in this state to see how resources are being used for death or for life. So why would California have 720 people on death row, and those prosecutors that go for those death penalties well know that in all likelihood the people are never going to be executed. The average wait of every single person on death row in California is 20 years because of the legal entanglements they have in the application of the death penalty. But why would a prosecutor then go for the death penalty? And, you knew, and I want to invite you to look into that. What's the motivation of the prosecutors in this state that go for the death penalty when they well know that there's life without parole and the people can be safe without the death penalty? Why did they go for the death penalty? And you want to dig into that. And you want to begin dialoguing with people about it. Somebody else. Um, hi. Oh. Where are you? Right here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, my name is Andrea. I go to Max Hayes, and my question would be: When you first started writing letters, do you think the way you are, do you think the way you are now, would be the outcome from writing those letters? Yes. You better believe it, because look what happened. First, it was the letters. He wrote back, realized he didn't have anybody to visit him. I said, "I'll come visit you sometime." I don't know. My whole life is going to be turned around. You know, in Latin America, they have a saying, the path is made by walking. We start walking on a path of something we believe in. And then I visited him and his brother. 
And then I found out about the victim's family and made a mistake at first, but then not afterwards of reaching out to victim's family. And then I'm with him when the state kills him in front of my eyes. And I see it with my own eyes. And that's what gave birth to my mission. I crisscross this nation more than any politician running for national office. If I ever decided to run for national office, I don't think I'd even have to put the billboards out. But <laughs> the thing is, it's about because you care about the people and educating the people. And you know what I've, what's been a great surprise? When I've talked to people, I've talked to people, all kinds of people, talked to people in synagogues and churches, talked to people in civic clubs, talked in schools, talked to parent associations. I don't find that the people are really wedded to the death penalty and they've thought it through and say, yeah, fry them at the end of the talk. They don't. They just go, oh, well, I've never thought about that. A lot of people don't even know how selective the death penalty is is out of about 15,000 homicides every year, less than 1% of people are selected for the death penalty. A lot of people don't know that two times now, when police chiefs in the United States have been given a list of 10 remedies to stop violence in the town, in their town or city, they put the death penalty dead last. Because they say most people who do crimes or kill people don't even think they're going to get caught. And if you're not thinking of the consequences, they can boil you in oil in the public square, and if you're not thinking of consequences, that's not going to stop you from killing somebody. Or you have this big deliberative thing of, shall I shoot them and kill them in a death penalty, or maybe it's going to be life without parole. Now, what? Let me see. <laughs> the, the way the police chiefs put it was, the people doing the thinking and the people doing the shooting are two separate sets of people. <laughs> yes. Oh, we over. We got to follow the mic. Oh, um, hello. I'm Tariq Shabazz from Horizon. And hello. based upon your speech, do you believe there could be a fair criterion for the death penalty? Could there be a fair criterion for the death penalty? Well, let's just think about that a little bit, huh? Well, how about the worst of the worst murders? That sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, what else would you say? You can't make as a criteria for it's going to have to be something really grave and grievous and terrible and horrible, right? But truthfully, if somebody kills my mother and I've lost the universe, she's my mother. Isn't that the worst of the worst? Yeah. How will we ever set the criteria? And that's the problem. You have a Supreme Court of the United States that has set this and said, now we're going to do this thing fair and evenly across the board. But you know what you can never deal with is the discretionary power of prosecutors. So you always, across, not just in Ohio, in Louisiana, we got side by side. A prosecutor goes for the death penalty, another one right in the neighboring county that doesn't go for the death penalty. So it'll never be evenly applied. So no matter how fair you try to set the criteria, finally it comes down to the human beings that got to apply it. And then you deal with very, very human beings. And that's why we make the mistakes, and that's why we're never going to get this right. Now, maybe we're going to make mistakes in sending people to prison. Okay. But at least they're alive. But with death, there's no way to undo that. There's no way to undo it when we make mistakes. And there are 138 wrongfully convicted people who've been exonerated off a of death row because mistakes were made. Big mistakes. Eyewitness. Oh, yeah, I saw him. Yeah, he's the one. And you only have the eyewitness. You don't have forensic evidence. Then Troy Davis. Did any, any of you hear about Troy Davis in Georgia? Here's this black kid in Georgia, and he had nine eyewitnesses said he killed that white policeman. Nine eyewitnesses, other, nine other black kids. Then, as the years go by, seven of those nine kids said, man, the police were forcing us, they were threatening us, they were intimidating us, and they recanted. Seven of the nine said, Troy, we don't know who shot that policeman. It wasn't, we don't know if it was Troy. We just said that because they were putting pressure on us. Seven out of the nine recanted, and yet no court in the land would give him a new trial. Because you know what they said? In the legal proceedings, that information came too late. You should have gotten that information earlier. And then you have somebody like Troy who says, I had a public defender appointed to me. He was overworked. He was underpaid. He didn't even investigate thoroughly each of these kids that were getting up there to say this. 
too late in the legal proceedings. And we have a Supreme Court. This is in my second book, The Death of Innocence. I get a lot more into the court proceedings and how they work, that there's something called procedural bars. And if you don't get it in early enough, even when there's evidence of innocence, it doesn't mean that you are assured a federal hearing in a court on evidence of your innocence. And we have people being executed. Legal, when things are legal, does not mean they are necessarily holy or good. Sometimes we tend to legalize things to make them seem good, as, for example, the torture memos that came out of what they did with the Geneva Conventions with the people taken in Guantanamo, suspected terrorists, enemy combatants. And here's what you do when you legalize something. The Geneva Conventions, which came out after World War II, about rights of prisoners of war, that they should not be brutalized or tortured, the Geneva Conventions say that. And so then when the pressure was on, we want to get information from these enemy combatants in Guantanamo, Alberta Gonzalez, who's the Attorney General of the United States under George Bush, he just said, well... Um, they're not really prisoners of war, are they? They're enemy combatants. So all the principles that apply to uh, uh, prisoners of war doesn't apply to them, and you can do anything to them, and they have done. I know some of the lawyers who have defended some of the people at Guantanamo, the waterboarding of people, hanging of people by their limbs, uh, putting them in cold chambers, uh, all forms of torture were done in Guantanamo, but you make it legal. There's a, a saint in the Catholic Church, Thomas Merton, who said, when the world ends, it'll be legal. <laughs> Slavery was legal. It was illegal to teach a slave to read. It was illegal to teach a slave to swim. And you could be hung for that. We always have to look at what's behind the laws and human rights trump. Human rights will always trump the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Somebody else. Hi, sister. Uh, Hi. My name is Jack Fitzgerald. I'm from St. Ignatius. Um, do you feel there's a correlation between um, the death penalty and other life issues like uh, euthanasia or abortion? Yeah. Well, I'm a I'm a Catholic, and, and so I stand for pro-life across the board of the dignity of all life, especially life when it's most vulnerable. And that's where we have to be there for, for life. So who's vulnerable? Well, old people with Alzheimer's who don't even know their name. Well, a little physician-assisted suicide here will help out. An unborn child is vulnerable uh, because the child doesn't have a vote. Children after they're born are vulnerable. What about children who live in poverty? We now have 49 million people living in poverty in this country. Poverty is on the increase. The disparity between wealth and poverty in this country has never been greater. We have 400 people in this country that have as much net income as half the population. So poor people, so children after they're born, so they don't have health care. So they're not getting good schooling. There's no Head Start programs. There's nothing for these kids. So it's to be for life across the board, especially where life is most vulnerable and where people don't have a voice. That's where justice calls us to take a stand. The mothers are vulnerable too, that are pregnant with the children. What about them? Who's supporting them? Who's helping them to choose life? So that's where we got to take our stand. We who are sitting in this room today are gifted. First, we're gifted with the gift of life. We are all alive. We've all been given the gift of life. And seeing the schools you're coming from and the level of your participation in this, one of the big moral issues of our day, I'm saying that you are also gifted with an education of the school you go to. I was gifted with a good education, too, from the sisters at St. Joseph Academy. And what are we going to do with those gifts? That's a question to us. Why have we been gifted? And what do we owe to our fellow citizens and our place in the world to make a difference where people never get this chance at life?
I think that means that's the end. We have books here if any of you want to get them, and I want to talk to your teachers about the play, getting the play at your school, and then also making books available for you. Thank you. It was a wonderful discussion. Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Shoemate. Wait, get that chance. Oh, excuse me. Everybody listen up. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Shoemate, a member of the City Club Youth Forum Council. I'm a senior at Shaker Heights High School. Today, at the City Club of Cleveland Youth Forum, we've been listening to Sister Helen Prejean. Before you go, we would like to ask you to fill out the surveys on your table and return them at the door. Thank you to our speakers, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. Hey, thank you.